do this. All right. Um, well, welcome everybody um, to the quarterly joint NARA COSO webinar. Um, I'm Kathy Popovich, and um, I'm from the Illinois State Archives, and I'll be introducing our speakers and helping with the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our two speakers for today. Uh, the first is Corinne Porter. Uh, she is a curator for the National Archives and Museum, where she develops exhibits covering diverse historical topics in American history, government, and culture. She joined the National Archives in 2007 and has worked in the exhibit program since 2013. She is the curator of Rightfully Hers, American Women in the Vote, which highlights the diversity of American women's experiences in winning the vote for one half of the people. Corinne holds a BA in History from Western New England College and an MA in Museum Studies from John, Johns Hopkins University. And our next speaker is going to be Sandra Treadway. She has served as Librarian of Virginia since July 2007 overseeing the library's comprehensive collection of print and manuscript materials, documenting the history, culture, and government of Virginia over the past 400 years. As state librarian, she also works closely with public and academic libraries, as well as historical organizations across the state to support their important work. Prior to her appointment as librarian of Virginia, she served as deputy director of the library and before that as head of the library's historical publications division. For the past two years, she has also served as state archivist, a hat that she is thrilled to have just passed on to Mike Strom. Sandy is a graduate of Manhattanville College and holds a doctoral degree in American history from the University of Virginia and a master's degree in library and information science from the University of Tennessee. So today's agenda, we're doing the welcoming right now, and then first uh, we will hear from Corinne Porter, who will discuss NARA's upcoming 19th Amendment exhibit, Rightfully Hers, which includes stories about the women's suffrage struggle at the state level. Um, and then I think this includes some information from the previous webinar, so we're not going to be going over GSA record scheduled projects, although I'm, I know that's a very interesting topic. Um, so next will be Sandy. She will provide an overview of her extensive research on women's suffrage, LVA's efforts to open women's collections, her work with the Virginia Women's Monument, and LVA's upcoming exhibit about the 19th Amendment. Um, and after we hear from our presenters, we'll have a Q&A session um, at the end, so be thinking of your questions and feel free to type those into the chat area. Um, there is a chat section and then there's a Q&A section. Um, if you could type in the chat section, that would really help us out so we can um, know where all our questions are coming from. And then after that, we'll have some announcements. So with that, I will pass this on to Corinne. Um, helps if I unmute myself when I start talking. Um, so thank you, Kathy, and um, thank you uh, to everyone for inviting me to come to speak today. Um, I'm Kareem Porter, curator of the National Archives. Um, so I'm going to just give you a quick overview of the exhibit, um, talk a bit about how it's organized, the types of stories um, that uh, we're telling in the exhibit, and then just sharing uh, a few of, of the records that uh, will be featured in the exhibit. And I do apologize, I'm getting over a cold, so if I have to stop and clear my throat or take a sip of water, uh, I apologize. Um, I'll try to keep that to a minimum. Uh, let's see. So, um, Rightly Hers uh, opens on May 10th, 2019, um, and it will be open um, in the Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery of the National Archives Museum in Washington, D.C. through January 3rd of 2021. Um, this is just the logo for the exhibit. Um, just wanted to, to share that with you. Um, 
So um, a bit about the approach that we took to the exhibit. Um, most of the uh, popular retellings of the women's suffrage movement and, um, and the 19th Amendment tend to focus on uh, just a, a few individuals who led the movement from the national level um, and um, the final years of the struggle, um, which really only represents the activity of uh, a privileged group of, of generally uh, white women. Um, so that's something that we, uh, we wanted to address, uh, address in this exhibit by broadening um, the, the narrative we tell, the history we cover, and also uh, 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 ensuring that our exhibit reflects the diversity of women uh, who were engaged in the struggle for women's voting rights um, and really bring their, their voices and their stories into, into this history. Something else that was important uh, for the National Archives uh, is that this exhibit uh, has relevance to uh, visitors today. So we also looked to find ways to um, connect with um, visitors where they are and to ensure that um, the story that our exhibit tells carries a, the narrative of the struggle for voting rights through the lens of women's experience um, as far um, forward towards the present as possible. So um, the exhibit is organized um, into five sections around um, um, the questions that are listed on your slide here, who decides who votes, why do women fight for the vote, how do women win the vote, uh, or win the 19th Amendment, excuse me, and what was the 19th Amendment's impact and what voting rights struggles persist. So most of the rest of the, my presentation is going to just walk through each of those sections of the exhibit and talk about the uh, topics that we deal with in each section. So uh, the first section, who decides who votes? Um, so uh, we felt that it was really critical to include this little uh, civics lesson um, at the start of the exhibit, um, especially since the role that uh, states played in, and continue to play in um, determining eligibility for voting in their specific states really profoundly impacted the uh, struggle for the 19th Amendment and, and struggles that for, uh, to vote that continued beyond 1920. So um, uh, we just uh, address the, the states that power have, the power that states have, excuse me, uh, um, in determining voter qualifications um, with the exception of when um, the Constitution has been amended to um, limit the powers of, of states to exclude certain groups of Americans from the vote um, uh, as a framework for understanding how the uh, struggle for women's suffrage unfolded from there. Uh, one other thing before I move on that I wanted to mention, uh, the big idea behind this exhibit and a message that is repeated throughout the exhibit as well as here is that the 19th Amendment it is a landmark moment, and it's certainly something we are, are celebrating, but we also want um, visitors to walk away understanding that the 19th Amendment did not give all women um, the right to vote. Um, states, uh, millions of women already had the right to vote um, uh, because their states had already enfranchised them before 1920. And, um, uh, many women continued uh, to struggle uh, to exercise their right to vote because they were um, uh, denied that right for reasons besides their sex. Um, so something that you'll probably hear me repeat several times throughout this um, presentation. So the next section is why did women fight for the vote? Um, uh, I love this section because I think this is uh, where uh, archival records, at least the, um, the National Archives uh, holdings, really shine um, because it's an opportunity to bring in some of those personal stories from women who fought for the vote and argued uh, and made the case to their government about why they needed to, to vote. Um, of course, uh, many women made the argument that um, it was unjust that women be denied with 
uh, they viewed as an essential citizenship right. Um, but also, um, uh, we have some great examples from women who demonstrate that the lack of, a vo of voting rights um, resulted in uh, real, tangible economic, social, and political consequences for these women. Um, um, and in particular, for, for women of color, because of their race, that um, they faced um, e even more risks and, and barriers as well. So I just want to share a couple of uh, records from this section of the exhibit. The first is a petition from Emily Barber uh, for a removal of uh, her political disabilities, um, as she put it. Um, so uh, in her petition, she, as a wage-earning woman, she uh, points out that she uh, uh, pays taxes but has no voice um, in how, uh, how those taxes are spent or any other uh, political representation, and that as a wage-earning woman, um, she was a teacher uh, with uh, you know, all the qualifications she needs um, uh, to teach in schools and, and to administer schools, she's only paid a third of uh, what her male colleagues um, are paid. So um, a, uh, a frustration that uh, I think many visitors uh, will be familiar with, but maybe possibly surprised to see that, um, that this is a problem that uh, women have been um, uh, struggling with for almost 150 years. Um, the next uh, record uh, I wanted to share is uh, uh, a petition from uh, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, they were the largest women's organization at the time. And uh, something that uh, I think uh, is uh, important to highlight for visitors is that most women didn't just wake up one morning um, and um, think that this is unfair, I don't have the right to vote, and all of my fam male family members do, and um, it should be my right. Certainly that was a, a valid argument, but most women um, came to uh, fight for women's suffrage because um, they faced um, uh, and were confronted with, with the limited limitations um, that they faced um, um, uh, without having that political power. So many women were involved in a variety of reform movements and um, ultimately came to, through that activism, came to uh, uh, support women's suffrage because they saw the value of having the vote in order to um, promote the reforms um, that they were working for. So um, on to the next section of the exhibit, how do women win the 19th Amendment? Um, this is obviously the, the kind of big, heavy-hitting section of the exhibit. Um, I've listed a number of, of the main stories this section of the exhibit tells. It's, it's really where we focus on um, the 72-year struggle, beginning with the um, uh, Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention um, and looks at the multitude of strategies um, that uh, women suffragists use, the critical players, and also the milestone achievements that um, incrementally made um, the, the triumph of the 19th Amendment um, finally possible in 1920. So um, uh, the first record in this section I wanted to share, um, since we're the, uh, uh, the National Archives, um, our holdings really lend itself to telling the story of the struggle for a constitutional amendment, but of course in the exhibit we um, make it clear that women were active at all levels of government at the national, state, and local level um, to agitate for their voting rights. So while we certainly um, uh, talk about the, the national organizations fighting for women's suffrage and the national leaders um, and the strategies they, de they devised, um, we also tried to pull in um, examples from states' engagement. Um, unfortunately, not, I was not able to include all, all states' um, effort, state-level efforts for, um, to win women the right to vote but trying to highlight the fact that the, that struggle looked different in different states and in different regions of the country. So this is a petition from the Texas Women's Suffrage Association. It's for, uh, a, uh, for the federal amendment, um, but of course, obviously, um, 
state suffrage organizations were also extremely active and played a vital role in the struggle for women's voting rights. Um, the next document is, is one of my favorites. It's, uh, it's called the Tabular Statement of the Grant of Limited Suffrage to Women in the United States. Um, I just, it's just such a fun chart to kind of uh, look at the uh, ways that women began to slowly chip away at gaining partial or limited uh, voting rights, um, as you can see, starting with Kentucky in 1838, long before when I think most, um, most people uh, think about when we're, women finally were successful um, with winning um, at least some voting rights. Um, and actually, I feel like I need to mention um, here, it's surprising, um, Kentucky in 1838, 10 years before Seneca Falls, so obviously the, the fight for women's voting rights long predates even um, that um, uh, moment in time. Uh, but the first women voters in the United States were actually women in New Jersey uh, in 1776. Um, when New Jersey wrote its first state constitution, um, it did not, um, it only, it said the only requirement for voting um, was a property requirement. So women, um, generally wealthy women who are either widows or single, who met that property requirement were eligible to vote um, in New Jersey for the first 30 years of the republic until the state changed its constitution to restrict the vote um, just to white men um, who met that property requirement. So women, as well as African American men, um, lost the vote um, uh, at that point. Um, so the next uh, petition is from um, African American petitioners in the District of Columbia. Um, it was actually signed by two of Frederick Douglass's children, um, Frederick Douglass Jr., um, whose name you might be able to pick out at the top of the men's column, and his daughter, Rosetta Douglas Sprague, who signs as Mrs. Nathan Sprague um, on, the, on the women's column. Um, so this is one of the documents we were able to um, include in the exhibit to help tell that more inclusive story about the essential role that African-American suffragists um, played in the fight for women's voting rights. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, what's really interesting about this petition is that it, uh, it's from 1878, uh, and, and all these petitioners are residents of the District of Columbia, and at that point in time, uh, nobody had the right to vote in the district. Um, the district has obviously had a long and checkered past of, uh, of, uh, of not enjoying full voting rights uh, um, in this country. Um, and so this petition is for a constitu constitutional amendment uh, to prohibit the state from disfranchising um, citizens on the account of sex. So the interesting thing about it is they're fighting for, asking for voting rights for women in the state. Um, and even if it had been successful, nobody who signed this petition would have gained the right to vote. Um, so, it was a goal um, of the exhibit to tell the more inclusive, uh, tell a more inclusive story representing the diversity of women who um, uh, were played a critical role in the success of the women's suffrage movement. Um, um, as I'm sure many of you are familiar, it, it was a challenge in certain respects to find records um, that uh, accurately reflect the level of engagement of some of those critical groups. Um, and that certainly was a challenge at the National Archives. Um, we just didn't have that many records um, related to the uh, suffrage activities of um, various groups of individuals, in particular women of color. Um, but we did uh, uh, borrow um, some records in some instances and also tried to come up with creative ways to, to tell their story. So one of the ways that we managed to do that was um, by using other records we have related to women that we knew were active in the suffrage movement, like Marie Baldwin. Um, she. Uh, and we know that she participated in the um, suffrage march in Washington, D.C. in 1913. And while we don't have any records related to her, um, to her participation um, in that march or the suffrage movement, she was a federal employee, so we have her um, personnel file. Um, so this is actually her photo from her official personnel file. She worked in 
the agency that today the Bureau of Indian Affairs is a lawyer. Um, so we're using that photo from her, um, from her file as an opportunity to, to tell her story in the exhibit. And um, one of the other ways that we uh, uh, devised to um, tell the story of uh, different women and uh, different critical um, activists in the suffrage movement was to come up with a concept of suffragist spotlights. Um, all they are are biographical panels um, that tell a particular woman's story. Um, you can see listed here, um, uh, there, were, there are four women that we feature in the section of the exhibit that I'm talking about right now and two more in a later section that I will get to shortly. Um, and uh, I just wanted to also uh, give a shout out to the State Archives of New Mexico uh, for providing uh, this scan of Adelina Otero Warren for her spotlight panel um, uh, for use in the exhibit. So thank you. Um, and of course, we have to uh, talk about the 19th Amendment itself in this uh, presentation. So finally, after decades of agitation, overcoming fierce opposition, um, the joint resolution proposing an amendment to the Constitution that would give women the right to vote uh, finally passes Congress on uh, the 4th of June in 1919 by the required two-thirds majority in both um, houses of Congress. And then it goes out to the states uh, for ratification. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, in order to become an amendment to the Constitution, um, a, proposed, a proposed amendment needs to be ratified by three quarters of the states, which um, was 36 during this time period. And the 19th Amendment is ratified by the 36th state on the 18th of August in 1920 when t Tennessee votes to ratify the amendment. And I'm obviously glossing over a really complicated history, but don't have a lot of time, so I, I'm just gonna keep moving, but um, as of the 18th of August, um, the right to vote, uh, uh, women's right to vote uh, is added to the Constitution. Um, so the next section of the exhibit, what was the 19th Amendment's impact? We wanted to at least briefly touch on um, uh, uh, the immediate impact that uh, women's enfranchisement um, under the 19th Amendment had. Of course, this is a topic that could be multiple different exhibits, so it, it really just touches on a few things. Um, looking at the first decade, roughly, um, after the 19th Amendment is ratified um, uh, to explore some of the successes and some of the setbacks that um, women encounter as new voters. Um, it also sets the stage for the longer term battles for um, uh, greater gender equality for women, um, racial equality, and also um, greater political representation that are um, still ongoing 100 years later. Um, we do have an interactive that we developed in this section of the exhibit to kind of help um, allow us to um, explore um, um, this topic in a little bit more depth, um, but it, it is a, um, uh, definitely keeps things at a, at a high level, but we didn't want to um, not talk about it at all in the gallery. <laughs> Excuse me. And then, of course, as I've mentioned already in the presentation, the 19th Amendment uh, 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 protects the right to vote on the basis of sex, but it does not give all women the right to vote um, because uh, women are continue to be excluded from the vote for reasons other than their sex. It also um, doesn't include all women who are U.S. citizens because it's only um, it only prevents the states from um, uh, disfranchising women on the basis of sex. So women in Puerto Rico, the District of Columbia, um, uh, women who don't yet have full citizenship, um, uh, Native American women, Asian immigrant women, um, continue to be excluded for, um, for myriad reasons. Um, so uh, we tried to uh, touch on as many of those um, ongoing struggles to vote as as much as we could and, and looked at what ultimately won them, the right to vote or at least um, some voting rights. And I should say, obviously, um, when we're talking about being um, disfranchised for reasons besides sex, 
um, men are included, but since uh, this exhibit is focused on women's voting rights, uh, we chose to try and tell those stories through women's experiences as much as we could. Um, and I just have one more record, if I can get the arrow to move forward, there we go. Uh, one more record to share, um, this is a pamphlet that um, uh, um, I think uh, does a better job than um, any exhibit label could ever do to kind of explain the, the ways in which um, uh, African American women in the, the in the Jim Crow South, and as well as men, um, continued to be um, uh, uh, barred from uh, voting and kept away from the polls. Of course, um, many of the voting restrictions that are outlined here also kept other Americans from voting. Uh, people who are poor or poorly educated or our uh, immigrant populations and um, because of the um, lack of educational and economic opportunities um, for women during this time period also disproportionately uh, affected women as well. So that is an exhibit uh, very, very quickly. I just wanted to talk about a couple of other resources that I thought might be of interest to you. Uh, we do have a companion uh, traveling exhibit uh, called One Half of the People, Advancing Equality for Women. It uh, covers uh, uh, women's voting rights, but also takes a uh, broader look at other women's equality struggles throughout American history. So um, that'll be touring for the next couple of years. Um, and we've also developed a Rightfully Hers pop-up cardboard exhibit that's going out to um, all 50 states, uh, schools, uh, community centers, archives, libraries, small museums, um, uh, to, to name just a, a few of the uh, uh, different sites that are receiving uh, the pop-ups. Unfortunately, unfortunately, all of them have been spoken for, but I did want to mention that uh, we will be placing high-res files of all of the panels of that pop-up exhibit on the archives.gov website um, by the time rightfully hers opens. So if it's something of interest, there'll be very high-res files that can be downloaded and printed at poster size um, and, and used uh, um, as, as, as you might want to use them. Um, and then uh, really quickly, um, we are in the process of digitizing um, all the state ratifications of the 19th Amendment um, and we'll be putting them on the National Archives online catalog. I wasn't able to get a, uh, a target date for that, um, but I do know that it is a goal to get those um, up um, and into the catalog before um, the 100th anniversary of the joint resolution um, and, and then of, uh, passing Congress and then um, uh, the ratification process. So um, in case that is something that um, any, anyone is interested in getting a high-risk scan of your state ratifications, that should be available in the near future. Um, and that, that is all I have. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to come and speak today. And, um, I've got my contact information um, and then just a couple of uh, links to information on the Rightfully Hers website and just other National Archives resources related to women's history. Um, and I look forward to answering your questions uh, later in the webinar. All right. Well, I, uh, this is Sandy Treadway. I guess I'm supposed to pick up from there. Um, and I just want to uh, thank Barbara Teague very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about what we're doing here in Virginia, um, but also to thank Connie for a great presentation. Um, Washington's just uh, two hours up the road, and I'm looking forward next spring, uh, or this coming spring, to going up to see Rightfully Hers. It sounds fabulous. Building on Connie's presentation, I'll be speaking today about the library's forthcoming exhibition on the suffrage movement. Um, oh, wait a minute. There we go. Sorry. Um, I'll be speaking on the library's uh, forthcoming exhibition on the suffrage movement in Virginia, which we hope to open um, in December of this year, and it will run through the end of 2020. But before I do that, I'd like to say a few words about the library's collections relating to women's history in general and share with you some of the ways that we've been drawing on our collections to tell a deeper and richer story about women's activities and accomplishments across four centuries of Virginia history. Um, we see our upcoming suffrage exhibition 
as part of a continuum. Um, and and we, really, um, we really think we're uniquely positioned to tell this story um, because the library, as many of you um, may know, is um, one of the state libraries that also has the responsibility for the state archives. So we've got, in addition to the rich records of state government, um, an extensive collection of books, local records, local histories, photographs, newspaper, private papers, church records, business records, um, materials documenting women's organizations. So we can draw on all of these kinds of things um, to tell a really um, rich and nuanced and um, deep story about women. Um, you know, I, I spent most of my career here at the Library of Virginia, and the reason is because um, when I got out of graduate school, I thought I would go and teach uh, at a college level, um, but the job market was really tight, and I took a job here at the Library of Virginia doing historical editing, and I got hooked on the collections, and that's why I'm here ever since, and especially on the collections that we have um, dealing with women's history. Having been part of opening our collections up to wider audiences has been a great um, privilege and also a passion of mine. Because when I got to the library, I realized pretty quickly um, our reading rooms were full of researchers, but they were using the same kinds of sources. Um, Virginia's sort of mainstream political history, and then of course all of our rich um, genealogical resources. But there was so much more. Um, and being able to help open those collections up has just been, um, been a wonderful thing. Um, when I started at the library, the field of women's history was just beginning to take off. And graduate students and others were coming to the archives wanting to research new topics. And they were asking questions that librarians and archivists hadn't really considered before and hadn't necessarily um, been trained to answer. But the questions that they asked prompted the staff to take a fresh look at our holdings and to realize what a gold mine of information about women's history they contained. In the early 1990s, for example, um, I recall getting a, a phone call from a graduate student from Yale University who had come to Richmond to research her dissertation, but she was having trouble finding sources. The topic she was interested in was Virginia women in public life and politics in the first half of the 19th century. So when she spoke with staff at the public service desk in our reading room, she was told that since women could not vote or hold public office during the period she wanted, we likely didn't have anything to help her. Um, I sat down to talk with her and realized right away she was defining politics very differently. In her view, it was a much more inclusive term than what political historians um, might have traditionally used. And if you expand the definition of politics to include other activities and forms of expression, then women were indeed political actors long before they could walk into a voting booth. So I suggested two places for her to start. One was to look at a woman named Lucy Barber. She was the widow of a um, Virginia governor and U.S. senator who had been a standard uh, or a, a member, a devoted member of the Whig Party. And Lucy Barber formed a statewide women's organization in the 1850s to raise funds to erect a statue of Henry Clay, the standard bearer for the Whig Party, on the grounds of the state capitol, a political act if there ever was one. And her organization's work was reported in the Richmond Whig newspaper, which was in our collection, but as of that time had not yet been cataloged. So I put her onto that story, and I also told her about our legislative petitions. Virginians petitioned their representatives to the General Assembly to take action on a host of public policy issues between the Revolution and the Civil War, and women signed many of those petitions. But no one had ever looked to see what the issues were that women supported and what that suggested about their activities and opinions. So with these two suggestions, this wonderful graduate student was off and running. She wrote a terrific dissertation that became a, a path-breaking book. I've got the dust jacket of the book up here on the slide, 
and also um, a, uh, an image of the statue to Henry Clay shortly after what it was erected. Um, but this book really changed the way we look at um, women and politics um, long before even the suffrage movement um, came about. Now, needless to say, in response to graduate students such as this very bright young lady, um, we here at the library began to make a concerted effort to identify collections and materials that related to women's history and to highlight them in ways we would never done before. We also looked at our backlog of unprocessed collections and reordered some of our priorities to ensure that women's history collections were much more accessible. One of the first of those that we looked at was the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia, the largest organization in the state working to secure the right to vote for Virginia's women. In the early 1990s, this rich collection had not yet been processed, and it was still packed in the original transfer boxes in which it had been brought to the archives in 1942. A few researchers had burrowed around in the collection, but without any organization or any finding aid, they missed so much. The Equal Suffrage League of Virginia was formed in 1909 by a small group of Richmond women that included several reform-minded community leaders, celebrated nationally known writers like Ellen Glasgow and Mary Johnston, um, and a host of women artists, um, teachers, um, and other women that had, had been uh, active in, in public life. The group elected educational reformer Lila Mead Valentine of Richmond to be their president. She actually served as president um, through 1920. The League focused on building membership across the state, beginning in Virginia's major cities, but as this collection revealed once it was processed, within a few years virtually every area of Virginia, including some pretty remote rural places, had a local chapter. The League launched an effective awareness campaign aimed at members of the General Assembly hoping to win their support for an amendment to the state constitution securing the vote for Virginia women. So the approach was very much a state approach. Legislation to this end was roundly defeated in every session of the General Assembly in which it was introduced. By 1916, it was very clear to Virginia's um, suffragists that the conservative legislature here was not going to budge, and the Equal Suffrage League joined the national effort to secure an amendment to the federal constitution. They were certainly right about that, because Virginia women did not become voters until Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify the 19th Amendment. Virginia did not ratify it at the time, and in fact, it wasn't until 1952 that Virginia, in a symbolic gesture, uh, that Virginia's General Assembly ratified the amendment. So when the amendment passed, the Equal Suffrage League transformed almost overnight into a Virginia League of Women's Voters. Many women involved in the movement became involved in the League, but others stepped back now that vote, the vote was secured. They'd been working for quite some time. They wanted to pass the, the leadership um, on to another generation. But what that meant was, when the Equal Suffrage League headquarters closed up shop, they took with them whatever documents, letters, publicity materials, photographs that they had in their possession. So individual women just went home um, taking with them uh, what they had. We might not have the documentation that we now do for the movement in Virginia had it not been for a woman named Ida May Thompson, who was secretary for the Suffrage League, um, and then in the 1930s was affiliated with the WPA's Historical Records Survey. She realized what didn't exist um, in any central place for the history of the suffrage movement, and she started writing to women she had worked with and said, what have you got? What material do you have? Would you be willing to send it to me? And so she assembled a collection uh, of what she could find and, and what survived, and she presented that to the State Archives in, in 1942. 
The processing of the collection began in the 1990s and it was finally completed in 2003. And the EAD guide is available, um, very, very complete finding aid um, to researchers through um, the Virginia Heritage uh, website. One of the things that became apparent as our archivist, our processing archivist who worked on this, Jennifer McDade, um, began going through the collection is that the suffrage movement in Virginia was more complicated than mainstream suffragists' memories um, had ever led on. And I think Connie uh, referred to that at the national level when she was talking about um, some of the diversity uh, uh, within the, the national suffrage movement. Well, it was there in Virginia too. It's just people didn't know about it till they had documents to delve into. Not all Virginia suffragists were content to take a more ladylike approach that Lila Mead Valentine um, and the mainstream suffrage league advocated, using reason, persuasion, um, and charm, uh, but not directly challenging um, the patriarchal establishment. But women such as Sophie Narodis, um, something funky happened with the slide here. I see the, the dates are a little uh, off center. But uh, Sophie Meredith and Pauline Adams became very disaffected with the state approach and joined the more radical Congressional Union, which later became the National Women's Party, um, very early on. And these Virginia activists and, and many others like them pushed very hard for a federal amendment. And they were willing to adopt more militant strategies to accomplish that goal. So both these ladies were arrested for picketing the White House. And Adams, as it turns out, was one of the suffragists imprisoned in the Lorton Workhouse in Occoquan, Virginia. Um, and the conditions there, um, which have been written about um, elsewhere, were pretty awful. Um, and I'm thrilled that we actually have in our collection Xerox copies of some letters that Pauline Adams wrote to her family um, on toilet paper because it's all she had to write on, and she had to bribe a guard to smuggle those out during her imprisonment. Um, so we will, in our exhibition, uh, be telling a much fuller story and a much more complex story than um, has been told before about the suffrage movement. We'll be including these differences of perspectives and some of the friction they caused and um, Connie alluded to this in her presentation, but we'll also be addressing the, the, the issue of race and how that played out. As African American women in Virginia made it clear, they were as determined as their white counterparts uh, to win the vote, but they faced significant obstacles and some backlash, not only from anti-suffragists, but some white suffragists themselves. Um, and we're really uh, wanting uh, to tell that, that story. I wish I could share with you the logo for our exhibit um, and um, the title. We're, uh, we don't open until a few months after the National Archives exhibit and we're still finalizing that and my graphic design team would not release it to me yet. They're still tinkering with it. But what you see here is an ad that um, they created for a special newspaper su supplement honoring women this month during Women's History Month. And I think the look and the feel of our exhibit graphics are going to be pretty similar. And I love that photograph of some Virginia suffragists heading down to Capitol Square um, to get their point across um, to the Virginia legislature. Virginia actually created a task force to plan exhibitions and programs to commemorate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. And they were successful just about a month ago when the General Assembly um, passed its final budget in getting some funding uh, to support that. So we hope to learn soon um, how much of that funding we'll, we'll be able to apply to our exhibit. What I can tell you though is the theme will focus on the concept of democracy through the expansion of suffrage and what it meant when women became full citizens um, of the United States. We want to demonstrate how remarkable and diverse a group of women in Virginia were who created that statewide organization and a political pressure group um, that held parades and rallies, distributed literature, staffed booths at the state fair, um, and lobbied legislators and congressmen, um, and in a few instances actually went to jail for their efforts. 
The exhibit will fill our entire exhibit space um, on our um, main floor of the library. We're planning a robust series of programs um, highlighting various um, themes in the exhibit throughout 2020. And when the exhibit closes at the end of 2020, um, similar to the, the National Archives, we will um, have a smaller panel version of the exhibit that will travel to libraries and local museums and historical sites across the state the following year. Now, while this exhibit is really important to us, and it will add tremendous new information, um, we hope, to um, the suffrage story, it builds on the library's work for many years in creating content related to women's history and, and something we're proud of. We have a Dictionary of Virginia Biography project here that documents the lives, um, among others, of hundreds and hundreds of women who made contributions to their locality, their state, and the country. Um, and we continue to add content to that. Um, this slide, uh, it's a little hard to read, but it shows um, that we also, during Women's History Month, honor uh, different Virginia women every year during March for their contributions to Virginia. And we do a poster. This is the front side of the poster. And um, let's see if I can get the, the uh, reverse side of the poster that goes to every school and every social studies teacher um, across the state. In 2013, the library published um, a book called Changing History, Virginia Women Through Four Centuries, and it has become the definitive book on the history of women in Virginia, the place that people start um, when they're doing their research. We were fortunate the three outstanding historians who have worked extensively in our collections were willing to serve as co-author um, of this work. And then um, in 2011, Virginia took a step that I never thought I'd see in my lifetime, um, but they actually created a commission to plan and erect a monument commemorating Virginia women's contributions to the state across four centuries um, and agreed to place that monument right smack dab at, at, in the heart of Virginia's Capitol Square. Uh, the monument has to be paid for with private funds, so it has taken a while to do that fundraising, but, but it is finally um, taking shape and the plaza has actually been uh, erected on Capitol Square. Um, partnering with the Women's Monument Commission, the libraries provided content and other resources related to uh, Voices from the Garden, which is what the title of the monument is. Um, and I've been fortunate to serve as a member of the commission, um, and that's been a really rewarding experience. This slide shows an early depiction of what the monument will look like. So there will be 12 bronze statues um, depicting women across various periods of Virginia's history, um, various backgrounds, various parts of the state. Um, and there will be a curved glass wall that you can see here. Um, that will have the names of many, many other Virginia women engraved on it. The thing that I hope you'll notice um, in this early artist's rendition is the monument is not one where women are up on a pedestal. They're not being looked up and revered. This is one where you will be able to walk in and encounter them eye at eye level, uh, where a school child can sit down and maybe have a picture taken next to um, uh, an early pioneer or Elizabeth Keckley, um, a, a woman who rose from slavery to be a successful uh, entrepreneur. Um, so there'll be real women with real stories, with strengths and also flaws like all of our, um, all of our um, heroes and heroines have. Uh, so we think it's going to be a very different kind of monument. Um, and although the, the uh, brass statues have not, they're still in the works, um, I did get an opportunity to go up to the uh, artist, to the studio in New York a few weeks ago. And this is um, <clears throat> a clay model of one of the statues. She is Adele Clark. She was a very young suffragist uh, in, in the teens. She became the first president of the League of Women Voters and a community li uh, leader in Richmond who lived a long, long time. She actually lived to be 101, and so she was attending General Assembly hearings when the Equal Rights Amendment uh, was being heard in the 1980s, um, sort of an amazing story. 
Um, so she will soon, uh, we approved the clay model, she will soon uh, be going off to be cast in bronze. And I'm secretly hoping somehow we can get a resin copy of this wonderful statue um, for our upcoming suffrage exhibit. Um, so I think I'll stop there um, because I know um, we are running a little, a little behind and I'd like to give some time for questions and answers. Um, but please don't hesitate um, to reach out uh, to ask questions or to um, contact us if uh, we can tell you more about the exhibit as it unfolds. So thanks so much. All right, thank you both so much uh, for your presentation. Sounds like uh, both of these exhibits uh, and programming are gonna be great um, and I'm sure very successful. So congratulations to both of you on all of your hard work and, um, and good luck as everything continues. Uh, so now we're gonna open up for some questions. Um, if you have any questions, you can type those into the chat box. Um, there is a chat box and then there's a Q&A. I'll try to keep an eye on both, but um, if you could try to put those in the chat box, I'd appreciate it. Um, so I do have a question to kind of start things off. Um, I think, Corinne, you mentioned that you had, are, are going to be displaying something from, uh, I think it was New Mexico. Um, were you able to kind of partner or um, get any materials from any other, either state archives or, or any other kind of institutions to include in your exhibit? Uh, uh, yes, so, well, the photograph of Adelina, uh, Adelina Otero Warren is the only item that I um, can recall that came from an, one of the state archives. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we are borrowing other items. Um, Howard University uh, is loaning several items. They have a great collections, um, especially for um, African American women's uh, sororities that were uh, formed right around uh, the 1913 suffrage march in Washington D.C. Um, as as well as um, uh, uh, records related to Mary Ann Shad Carey, which are, are what I specifically borrowed for um, um, the exhibit. And then most of the other items I borrowed have come from um, organizations like the National Women's Party, and then we uh, um, are really fortunate that the Presidential Library System is part of the National Archives, um, mm. so I was able to uh, borrow a number of items from, from them as well. Um, so, but I, I did actually want to mention um, that uh, uh, the online collection from the Library of Virginia related to women's suffrage is really great. So I hope uh, um, uh, you all get a chance to, to check it out. Great, thank you. Um, all right. And then, um, Sandy, oh, this is Barbara. Um, yeah. I don't see any other questions, but I just wanted to ask one instead of typing it. I unmuted myself. <laughs> I just wonder about the, um, you know, there's such a wealth of material that you're both discovering. How do you really pick out the, I guess, the the document or the photograph or the object that you want to, that you're going to use out of everything that you have available. I just, I, I just always wonder about that when you're doing an exhibit, when you have things that really do such a great job of illustrating what you're trying to convey and what you're trying to let us know <laughs> that you have in your collection. So how, how, does, how does your thought process work, I guess, when you're doing that? Uh, for us, we try to look for things um, that may not have appeared anywhere before or something that um, may reveal what I call a surprise, something that, uh, again, that makes that story a little more complex. Um, and and so sometimes you just get something that's just visually so compelling and interesting that that, that stands out um, above, above the other things. Um, I do want to give Corinne, a chance to answer that, but I do also see another question, different type one on the, in the chat. So maybe Corinne, you answer that and then we can tackle the, the question that's there. Uh, 
Sure. Um, and I, I would agree with uh, Sandra. Definitely visual, interest visual appeal um, is really important. Um, it's hard to acknowledge that looks do matter in an exhibit, especially where records are um, concerned. Um, and the other thing that I'm always looking for is, uh, you know, always trying to be mindful of the the burden that we place on on visitors, since uh, uh, archival materials require generally uh, visitors need to read the document in order to really have an engagement with that exhibit item. Um, so I'm always looking for records that are um, their meaning is really clear. Um, it's, it's, it's a readable document and easy to understand to really um, um, make it accessible and easy to engage with um, uh, for the visitor um, and not uh, put too much of too much effort um, on them in order to read and, and understand. All right, so the question in the chat box um, from Lacey Johnson, is anyone bringing their exhibits to the present with the modern women's marches? Uh, we are definitely bringing up to the present to highlight um, issues, themes, challenges, um, that the suffrage movement didn't, you know, didn't wasn't able to, to resolve, and that we still are grappling with today. I'm not sure if we're at, uh, about the marches particularly because um, I haven't seen the final script for our exhibit, but we are going to talk about, you know, Virginia just recently um, considered the ERA again, and unfortunately, from my perspective, anyway, did not did not uh, pass it. So I know that we um, we will be uh, we have a banner that we'll be using from the current ERA um, struggles um, that will be part of that. So yes, we do want to have a, a section at the end reflecting on, um, on, on today's issues. Um, and uh, uh, we also are, uh, I see that there was another question that came in that also asked about the ERA specifically. Um, so uh, I had mentioned in my presentation in the one section of the exhibit that looks at the impact of the 19th Amendment that we have an interactive that uh, allows us to do a little bit deeper exploration of some of the more um, recent uh, or recent as, as in uh, post-1920 uh, women's equality struggles. So it certainly deals um, with the ERA. It kind of walks through three kind of rounds slash generations of, of struggles in, in that 100-year period. So. Um, so we deal with uh, we deal with ERA um, um, and uh, and the fact that it was actually not very uh, widely supported by most uh, progressive women um, in 1924 when it was first proposed um, in Congress. Um, um, so and we don't deal with the marches directly, but we used the. Uh, uh, visual uh, uh, recognition of, of the marches as uh, uh, inspiration for some of the design elements for the, uh, for the exhibit. So we actually um, have a lenticular uh, that overlays uh, an image from the uh, Women's March in D.C. Um, with a, a view up Pennsylvania Avenue showing the women marching in 1913. Um, we don't talk about specifically about the Women's March, but um, it was just such an impactful image to um, uh, see those two together um, that uh, we actually have it. It will be outside the gallery um, uh, to kind of catch visitors' eyes and hopefully draw them into the gallery. And certainly there's a lot of uh, correlation between you know, generally when you talk about or think about and visualize the women's suffrage movement, you picture um, the silent sentinels holding their banners outside of the White House. They were the first Americans uh, to picket the White House. Uh, so certainly the, the cultural protest that is, um, you know, very much a part of our, uh, you know, contemporary um, conversation and activism, uh, you know, there's, there's the visual ties to that. So. We don't talk to it directly, but visually there's a, a relationship there, so we kind of use it in that way um, to kind of signal to visitors that, hey, this is a, a historical exhibit, but it's one that continues to be relevant and, and resonate today. Great. Thank you so much um, to 
both of you. It was great presentations. Um, we are a little bit over time, so I'm going to go ahead and quickly throw this to Barbara. <laughs> Oh, thanks very much. We really appreciate everyone uh, joining us today. We have at the end of our, um, Kathy, if you could move this slide for me, or do I do it? If we have a short, um, uh, you know, there are ways to stay connected with COSA, which many of you are familiar with, and many ways to stay connect, connected with NARA. Uh, their social media is really interesting. If you're on Twitter or Facebook, they have so many ways to connect with the National Archives. And also, we do have a webinar evaluation for you today. I think our content was really great. Uh, please try to overlook our earlier uh, snafus with technology and let us know what you thought about our webinar overall. And when you exit the webinar, that will take you directly to the, uh, to the webinar evaluation. We do appreciate everyone being with us today and thank you so much to our great presenters, Corrine Porter from NARA and Sandy Treadway from the Library of Virginia. And thank you very much to Kathy for moderating for us. Bye everyone. <laughs>